Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Amir Kachui from United States. Dr. Kachui is currently Associate Professor at the Mashhad University of Medical Sciences in Mashhad, Iran. After completing his residency at the Mashhad University of Medical Sciences, Dr. Kachui completed several fellowships in the United States, some of which are Hand and Elbow Research Fellowship as part of his doctoral work at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, another Hand and Elbow Research Fellowship, again part of his PhD program at Rothman Institute Hand Service in Philadelphia, United States. He completed his PhD program at the Academy Medical Center in Amsterdam in Netherlands during his period 2017 to 2021. He is also part of a clinical fellowship at Rothman's Philadelphia currently. Notable among his achievements include a list of US patents, five in number, some of which are apparatus for anatomic three-dimensional scanning and automated three-dimensional cast and spill design, 3D printed anatomical model, elbow exoskeleton utilizing a combination of electrical stimulation and near infrared spectroscopy, system and method for an external hip fixator, orthopedic dual sliding compression plate. He's also editor for four books and has also contributed several book chapters. He's more than 100 publications and has been cited more than 1,000 times for his research. He's a reviewer for several journals and he currently serves as deputy editor in chief for the archives of bone and joint surgery. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Amir Kachui from the United States. Oji Amir. Thank you so much Hitesh, for the introduction. And uh, this is a great honor uh, for me to present today for this webinar. So as you said, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from different places who are watching this presentation at this point. So uh, my talk is about radial head fractures and probably the appropriate treatment and decision-making about what to do with a radial head fracture. So let's just start with, with the history. So Mason is uh, probably a well-known person. He's not the first, but probably his paper has been cited many times in his classification regarding the radial head fractures. So he mentioned that when you have a radial head fracture, when in doubt, take it out, reject. So it was simply followed over the years, different surgeons, and when they were facing a radial head fractures, assuming that there is no need for keeping it in place or fixing it with different multiple complications, they were taking this out. However, you know, many researchers came along and did multiple research that probably this is not a good idea just to simply take it out without doing anything. So radial head fractures account for about 30 to 44% of elbow injuries and 1.5 to 4% of adult fractures. There are multiple treatments for the radial head fractures, which can be classified into four types, which is one non-operative treatment, excision of the radial head, ORIF, internal fixation, and replacement. So we have these four categories of radial head fracture treatments. So how to decide which treatment is appropriate one? Classifications now appear to help us make a decision regarding the radial head fractures. There are multiple fractures along the time in history came out starting from 1926 and the last one was in 2015. And each one accounted accompanying or associated injuries and the, you know, the amount of displacement to make a classification, which makes it easier for decision-making regarding treatment. So the challenges that we have, what are the challenges when we face radial head fracture? Is it preserve the head or simply excise, operate or non-operative? And if you're going to operate, do we have to fix or replace the head? Now let's see how we can move on. So I'm going to use this diagram, which is published 
in uh, Rock Within Grains, 2015 by Graham King. Uh, they kind of classified radial head fractures to displaced and non-displaced and based on motion block. So just keep that in mind and we're going ahead and we'll use this diagram along the talk to see how we can uh, use this diagram to manage the radial head fractures. So here's the case, one patient, 2003, this is the initial X-ray. Based on Mason classification, which is, I go through type one, two, three, depending on the amount of displacement. So less than two millimeter displacement or less than 30% involvement of the head is considered type one. So this is a type one fracture, 2003. And 2009, after six years, you can appreciate well-healed radial head fracture with no subsequent um, arthritis, which is based on the Giton and ring modification. We have grade zero or one. It's zero is no uh, arthritis or very minimal, and one is moderate to severe. So that's a zero or one arthritis. So here is the radial head fracture type two, about uh, more than 30% of the head involvement and or uh, two millimeter displacement or more. So the initial x-rays show a type two, two uh, happened in 2000 and 2009, after nine years, you can appreciate you know, it's well healed in place. Even if there is a little bit of step off, Still, there is no arthritis and it can be classified as grade zero arthritis. And the type three Mason classification, you can see that it's a complete head fracture, probably minimally displaced, but uh, treated non-operatively 2009 and 2013, it's about four years later, you can again appreciate, you know, it's well healed, uh, good results, and no subsequent arthritis, which is classified as grade zero. So I showed you great, uh, you know, Mason types one, two, three, all types that have been treated non operatively and we had good results afterwards. So it seems like if fractures are really non-displaced or minimally displaced with no block in motion, we can start early motion with no surgery. So based on this diagram, if we have a non-displaced fracture or we have a displaced, which is not blocking the motion that we have to test, we're gonna start early motion and do non-operative management. However, don't forget about the maltreatments. So this is a type one, Mason type one radial head fracture. You can see it's casted. So it's in supination, probably old practice, very historic, but now uh, no one advocates for casting. So the advocate is it to start early motion when you have this type of fracture, which is non-displaced or displaced with no block in motion. And this person, this case, so you can see probably this is a type two or three Mason fracture dislocated, which is unstable and probably requires surgery. However, you can see it's casted malposition in a dislocated position is in the cast. So not every case can be treated non-operatively. One more point that we have to consider is the kissing lesion that you might see the cartilage defect uh, about the capitellum. So if you have a radial head fracture, which is non-displaced, and if you find out in follow-up, you've developed some arthritis, it might not be because you maltreated radial head. It might be because you have had injury to the you know, cartilage on the other side, which is called a kissing lesion. And we showed here. So, Let's go over another case. So a 48 year old woman at the time of presentation, this is a type two Mason 
radial head fracture, she had full rotation. So the decision is with no dislocation, the decision is toward uh, treating non-operatively with early motion and management. So here is the CT scan. You can see there is no coronoid fracture, no accompanying injuries, bony injuries, actually. We cannot see ligamentous injuries and we, we cannot, this is not a dynamic examination to know if ligaments are injured or not. Therefore, this patient comes back after two years with ache, click, and you can see some arthritis, which is called Mickey Mouse ears. If you see here, that is kind of like a Mickey Mouse ears. And on CT, you can see these, you know, the ears of the Mickey Mouse, which are the osteophytes behind the olecranon forming due to subtle instability that might be present because of the, at the same time the radial head is fractured, there is a subtle instability because of ligament injuries, which we cannot recognize at the time of injury. Uh, it might end up to arthritis. I don't say the percentage is very high, but we have to just keep it in mind. They might have this issue. Let's go to the other treatment. The other treatment for radial head fracture is open reduction internal fixation. So when can we use ORIF? It's recommended when we have a displaced fracture and we have a block in motion, then we need to do surgery. If the fragments are repairable, it's recommended to perform fixation. However, probably I've seen uh, many complications with open reduction. If it's not chosen and you know, patient selection is not appropriate to find an appropriate patient for open reduction. This is a patient who had a fracture dislocation, let's say a kind of Montagia fractal dislocation with a radial head fracture type three. And you can see after fixation, there is a great deal of arthritis about the capitular, radial capitular joints. Another patient, 2003, radial head fracture type three, Mason type three, which is, <clears throat> has undergone open reduction internal fixation. <clears throat> and you can see subsequently the patient developed extensive arthritis, especially at the radial capitular joint. And this patient, a 35 year old male, 2007, open reduction internal fixation, and subsequently because of the painful non-union <clears throat> had to be converted to uh, arthroplasty. So the meta-analysis comparing these to arthroplasty versus internal fixation showed that it's better to use arthroplasty and there are more complications with open reduction internal fixation when you have a type three or four Mason fracture. <clears throat> So probably we can just reserve open reduction internal fixation for type, let's say two, not to type one, probably we can only do uh, non-operative management, type three and four recommended to go for um, replacement and type two probably can be reserved for internal fixation. The other treatment is excision of the head. So where is it located and where is the blow? place for excision. So studies show that if we excise the head, there is more load going to be on the uh, ulnar trochlear joint, which is nine times body weight if the radial head is excised. Other study which is uh, frequently cited by Atuna 2010 was that uh, after excision of the radial head, there is a high chance of developing arthritis in the joint, especially the capitular side. No one knows why, because there is no contact, there is no bone contact, but probably that's because um, it's unloaded or shielded against the load. However, we see more rate, you know, higher rate of arthritis uh, 
it's not related to the functional impairments. So we just have to keep that in mind that excision of the head can cause arthritis of the joint, although it's not related with the functional impairments. Another recent study of you know, comparing excision uh, versus arthroplasty, which was done also in Iran actually, uh, because of shortage of metallic implants, they compared these two actually for those patients that they removed, they excised the head in place, they repaired the medial site. So LCL repair was uh, standard part of the standard protocol for all repairs. And patients who had excision of the head also had MCL and medial capsule repair at the same time. So results showed comparable, uh, comparable outcome between excision and arthroplasty. Only if MCL and medial capsule were repaired instead of radial head replacement. So don't forget, if you're excising the head, probably you have to repair the other side. They also reported a complication which cannot be addressed simply by repairing the medial side. We know that s leprosy is a longitudinal instability because of the rupture of the central band in the intraosseous ligament. And you can see, um, on the left side, the radial head excised, the radius has migrated proximally. And on the right side, you can see the wrist X-ray that uh, there is a shortening of radius, which is uh, not very common, but cannot be addressed just with excision and repair of the medial side. Just to assess uh, when we're excising the head. We performed actually two studies, two different studies. <clears throat> One was for intraobservable reliability of the two tests intraoperatively um, to assess if we have longitudinal instability and disruption of the intraosseous ligament. So the two tests are pool test and lateral pool test. So the first one is longitudinal pool that you after excising the head, you grab the shaft and you pull longitudinally. The second one is pulling it toward the lateral, not longitudinal. Uh, so interobservable reliability, just to sense as quantitative, qualitative test was fair. It was not high. So we performed a measurement for the lateral pull test to figure out cutoff value and the position which is the most appropriate position to examine the intraosseous ligament. And we found out that uh, the best position to examine intraoperatively is in supination. First of all, you have to examine that in supination. It can be in either extension or flexion, uh, whichever shows uh, both high sensitivity and specificity and the numbers relative to capitellum, the displacement is about six millimeters for extension and nine millimeters for flexion. Therefore, let's get back to the diagram again. So if we have a radial head fracture, if it's displaced, blocking the motion, and we have large unpredictable fragments, and don't forget, ligaments are intact, then we can excise the head. So here, the most important thing is intact ligaments, which not always ligaments are intact. And that's the concerning and the scary part that we cannot really still, we cannot uh, figure that out at the time of injury or even surgery. So it's like, uh, as an example, just uh, want to make it better understandable if we consider bone as a cracker and ligaments as the cream, when we break the cracker, the cream is also breaking. Therefore, when we have a fracture, ligaments as a cream also can be attenuated or disrupted. 
So we have to know that when we look at an X-ray and we see a fracture, indirectly, it comes to our mind that probably there is something going on with the ligaments as well. So under fluoroscopy, you can, you can examine the patient. So after replacing the head, probably you can see that still the patient is unstable and easily it can be subluxated or dislocated. So this can be part of your intraoperative assessment for the ligaments to know how you can proceed or if you need to reconstruct the ligaments or not. So as an example, a 55 year old woman after a motor vehicle accident presented with this elbow dislocation, it was a simple elbow dislocation with uh, actually with a radial head fracture, not a simple dislocation, a radial head fracture dislocation, underwent surgery, um, uneventful surgery, the radial head was excised, simply reduced, the joint was reduced and has been in this plane. However, after three weeks, the patient presented with this X-rays showing that the simple excision of the head just causes more instability while we have already unstable elbow with disrupted ligaments. So simply excising the radial head is not accepted anymore. And we have to do either something for the radial head as replacement or repair or repair the ligaments in replace. So we have to decide whichever is available, replacing the head or, I mean, preserving the head or ligament repair. Many studies just showed that if we have a radial head fracture, depending on being displacement, displaced or comminuted, accompanied with one type of ligament injuries, it can be whichever, LCL, MCL, or intrasus ligament. And you can see there is a high rate of ligament injury, even as high as 100% within one study, that we have some type of ligament injury with just type one radial head fracture. So it's not always, we say, because it's a type one, so probably there is no ligament injuries, especially even with non-displaced fractures, we might see a high rate of ligament injuries. So just we have to be cautious about this finding. So the best way to assess is dynamically we assess ligament injuries and assess instability intraoperatively and be prepared to uh, repair whatever we need. So a simple valgus stress test after excision of the head, if it's unrepairable, shows medial opening, the medial side opening, which is an indirect sign of instability. So we cannot just leave the elbow alone like this and just simply excise the head. Therefore, we need to either replace the head or repair the medial side. And so this is one patient after repairing the lateral side, replacing the head. You can see under fluoroscopy, the medial side is still gaps open slightly. So what do you think? Do you think we need to repair the MCL as well? Because we replaced already the head and we have um, LCL repair. So this patient after one year follow-up, full range of motion, no pain. And probably in my experience so far, we did our replacement of the head and lateral repair. Uh, I can say we only did one medial side repair. Uh, so probably you don't need to repair the medial side if you are replacing the head or preserving the head you have to either do MCL versus radial head replacement. There is a very rare instances that you probably find a very unstable elbow after standard approach to elbow, which is coronoid, if fracture, radial head, and LCL repair. These three components, if you address these three, you don't really need to address the medial side. So, 
this case shows that even if you have medial side opening and MCL, torn MCL, if you address well on the lateral side, replace the head and maintain the length, you don't really need to go after the MCL. So the fourth type of treatment, arthroplasty. So we talked about non-operative, open reduction internal fixation, excision, and arthroplasty. Uh, probably this is very you know, commonly done uh, surgery, very straightforward, and very good results actually showed uh, over the past many years. Uh, that's why you know, many surgeons are, uh, have a trend toward replacement of the head better than having a hard time fixing the pieces together and eventually end up to non-union, failure of fixation, and multiple complications and subsequent surgeries, or even excision or whatever else treatment they can have. So uh, good results makes the surgeon, both the surgeon and the patient happy just to use it as a standard of care. So in one study that we did for factors associated with removal of the radial head. So we know that radial head prosthesis is, is mostly done for to stabilize the elbow while the collateral ligaments heal. So we need the radial head as an spacer. When it's there, it helps the ligament heal in a proper appropriate length and stabilize the elbow. So once the ligaments are healed, even if we remove the radial head, the elbow should stay in place. So our results in that study showed that we have uh, not too much, actually not many cases of radial head removal or revision. If you can, you see on this survival uh, diagram, it shows the highest number of removal were done in the first year, which is almost 50% of the whole cases. And then it decreased to half every year. And after probably two or three years, we didn't have any removal anymore. And so the findings of this study was we only had 8% removal of revision. So probably 90 to 92% of the patients did not come back to remove the head. And it's not a weight bearing joint. Therefore, we don't expect this to wear off wear along the time. So the highest rate of removal was during the first year, which we had 11 out of 22 removal. And the most reason, the, uh, the most frequent reason to remove the head was just for to excise the heterotopic ossification and for elbow stiffness rather than causes because of uh, replacement. So there, was, there were few issues with the uh, radial head processes, including infection, break, loosening, or something similar. But most of the cases were done, they were, the removal were done just to release the elbow and excise the ossification. And interestingly, most of the implants were placed by trauma surgeons and removed by hand surgeons, showing that it's a discretion of the surgeon just to remove the head, not uh, something as an you know, objective. So another study that we did also a systematic review and meta-analysis on different types of radial head processes to know which one probably ends up to more frequent removal and which one has highest survival rate. Uh, we subgrouped this study to different fixation types as cemented, loose fit, press fit. And almost these three types showed comparable results, comparable rates of removal, showing that uh, there is not a significant difference in removal, removal rate among these three. Dividing the types of arthroplasty to bipolar versus monoblock also showed comparable results. And dividing and subgrouping the radial head processes to longest stem versus shortest stem also showed comparable results. So 
In our study, the pooled rate of removal and revision in all the studies was 11%. So the one study that we did in our own cases was 8%. So the pooled data showed 11% of the whole removal and revision, showing that approximately 90% of radial head implants uh, stay there. They're with satisfactory results with no need to remove or revise, which is very satisfactory and promising. And most of the removals were done for heterotopic ossification excision, as well as stiffness release, which is almost more than 50% of the whole cases done just for release of the elbow, which can be done uh, either with different, uh, different other treatments even. It's not related to uh, implants only. However, there are some um, particular complications related to the implants, such as you know the bipolar dis disassembly, which is well known, and probably that's the reason why bipolars are not. Uh, there is not much of a trend toward bipolars anymore, and many reports showed that. Uh, there is a disassembly uh, between the components, as well as like this one you can see, which is a dis disappointing result, uh, leading to more revision rate. And so the surgeons are uh, trending toward monoblock processes now. Uh, another study also showed that if you use uncemented loose feet, as I showed you, it's not a press fit. It's just loose feet that you put it in, no cement. It does not be, need to be press fit and can rotate. The stem can just move and rotate inside the canal, which can act basically as a bipolar prosthesis. Instead of uh, moving around the neck, it can move inside the canal, which can be safely and studies show that there is very li little chance of uh, loosening with this type of implants. And so some studies are also have shown that if you have a press fit implant because of stress shielding, there is a chance of loosening osteolysis and requiring removal. So this study showed really high number of loosening, which is 32%, and removal, 24%, uh, with press fit implants, which probably also, if you want to mention short versus longest stem, we know that the axis of rotation starts from radial head and goes to it toward the <clears throat> ulnar head. This is the axis of rotation of the forearm. And so the implants, that we put, if they're a short stem, we can probably aim that toward the biceps tuberosity, which is basically aiming toward the, along the axis of forearm rotation. And here also you can see happens the same. So probably if we want to use a longer stem, we have to change the axis. So the axis have, it has to follow the axis, the canal of radius which is going to be deviated from this axis of rotation. Therefore, a short stem probably is more uh, kind of appealing here, satisfactory to use. So let's get back to the diagram we were using. When we have a radial head fracture, we have a motion block, displaced fragments, and fragments are unpredictable and we have ligament rupture, probably it's better to go for a radial head arthroplasty. So kind of concluding the arthroplasty topic that we're talking, we probably can choose a monoblock, loose feet, short stem that can do whatever we, we need there. And we really don't need long as them more, uh, much more sophisticated implants uh, 
because we're just using it as an as a spacer there until the ligaments heal. So simply it can be just a monoblock in a loose fit one. And it de decreases surgery time easily. The technical uh, matter is very simple. The learning curve is very easy and everyone can do that with the results show very few complications with this type of implants. So what if we need to remove the implants? So other study that we did on, you know, the 14 cases with, uh, after removing the implants to increase motion, all cases, all patients showed improved function, improved range of motion and lessen pain. Uh, so even if you need to remove the head to release the stiffness and the patient has limited motion, you can simply and safely do that and be confident that you can gain more motion without uh, compromising the other tissues. So just to replace the head with arthroplasty, uh, in case you have a shortage of metal implants or you know some areas, um, the availability in under-resourced areas, you can use bone cement, which is polymethyl metacrylate. And most of them are antibiotic impregnated uh, powders that you can use. And the benefit is, first of all, they are available, they're cheap, and they have antibiotics. And in our patients that we used bone cement, we didn't have any single case of infection. That's probably one of the advantages of using this. And through this study that we had to use, so we had to replace the head, we started using bone cement uh, to produce, to actually make the original head implant. Uh, to make it and to make an anatomy uh, radial head, we use the CT scan of the contralateral side, the contralateral elbow. We mapped the head, designed it in the software, and uh, made a mold just to have the bone cement inside the mold. And when it hardens intraoperatively, you can take the implant out of the mold. It's hardened, so it hardens out of the body. You don't need to put it inside to be concerned about the heat and the burning the tissue around it. So it's already an implant when you take it out of the mold and you can easily and simply replace it. And so basically it's anatomic implants and the conformity of the head is exactly the conformity of the patient's uh, radial head, which is a custom made implant we can do. So there are reports that you can even make these implants in the OR without getting the anatomy of the patient. You can just simply use one, you know, a single screw or a K-wire um, as an intermediary uh, reinforcement and have the cement around it just to use it as a spacer in that area. In this study, we, we tried to design the head based on the CT scan uh, and the finite element analysis comparing bone cement, peak and metal showed that we have more even distribution of forces with bone cement. What does that mean? So when we have more even distribution, it means that we have less stress shielding. So then we have less bone resorption around the neck and um, in the capitellum, which is uh, widely reported as osteopenia of capitellum after replacement of the head. So this can at the same time preserve bone density in uh, around the radial neck 
and along the radius. And uh, the, the paper is published uh, with the results of our patients as well. And this one, this patient, after radial head replacement using bone cement. And I showed you uh, previously the results with no pain and complete motion and function. Uh, and the X-rays of the, say, uh, actually another patient with complete range of motion, <clears throat> no pain and full return to activities after 18 months. And another patient with no subsequent arthritis, no osteopenia, no resorption of the neck and acceptable results. And the patient is happy. So we talked about different treatments for radial head fracture, including non-operative management, excision, internal fixation, and arthroplasty, which are basically four types of fractures or the whole thing we can do for a radial head fracture. Based on the diagram I showed you, depending on motion block, we can go ahead with non-operative and early motion or fixation, excision, or replacement of the head. So there are many upsides and downsides with each one of them. Probably what I can recommend by the end of this talk and the whole studies that we did, just simply classify the radial head fractures to stable and unstable fractures. So stable, you can probably mention that if the fragments, the bone fragments of the radial head have the contact between the fragments is maintained and you don't have a frank dislocation, you can consider a radial head fracture as stable. If the contact between the fragments of the radial head is not maintained and there is a gap, and, is, and also we have a dislocation of the elbow, we probably need to we consider that as unstable radial head fracture. So based on this classification for a stable, the goal of set, the goal is motion. So probably we don't really need to do surgery. So we can start early motion, which you can see we can gain motion pretty well. If the fracture is considered unstable, the goal is stability. And for gaining stability, we need surgery and we do surgery my recommendation is head replacement. So in few instances, probably you can also do internal fixation. I don't recommend uh, excision of the head because we cannot really make sure if we have a longitudinal instability or not. If you can examine intraoperatively, if you don't have access to implants and you just need to excise the head, probably you can repair the medial site. However, the first choice, if everything is available, is a radial head replacement, which can basically be a monoblock, loose feet, and a short stem one as a first option. But all options are you know, open depending on the availability and the preference of the surgeon. So using this diagram also probably can simplify our management toward the radial head fractures, just to make a decision instead of making it complicated. Uh, getting back to the classification, in the beginning I said about Mason classification, and he mentioned in his paper, when in doubt, take it out and excise. Now probably we can get back to the recommendation of Johnston in 1962. When in doubt, treat conservatively. You don't miss anything. If you treat conservatively, don't excise it. Let it be there, wait for one or two weeks and see how range of motion goes. If some of the patients are in pain and they will gain motion with 
type two or even type three of radial head fracture. So by treating conservatively, you're not uh, burning the bridges. You can still go back and do a surgery. So this is going to be the take home message, the diagram that I last showed you and this quote from Johnson, when in doubt, just treat conservatively. Thank you so much and for your attention. Any questions, I'm ready to answer. Thank you, Amir, for that brilliant presentation of yours. Your extensive research experience added so much of value to the presentation. And I really like the last slide of yours, the statement made by Johnston. And in fact, I had a patient off late who I just followed the same principle, treated it conservatively with reasonably good results. So exactly. Exactly. I have actually, you know, similar patients that bilateral radial head fractures, I operated on one side and did not operate on the other side because of, you know, some you know, general anesthesia, whatever. And the patient is more satisfied with the non-operated side, even if I thought I'm doing better job on the, you know, the sur surgical side. So as much as you can treat non-operatively. Thank you, Amir, for that. A uh, couple of questions uh, from the audience as well. Now, what do you think is the role for an MCL repair? You've mentioned the role of MCL repair in case you're doing a radial head excision. So that would be in a circumstance where you're not planning a radial head replacement, right? Or where the facility for a radial head replacement is not available, isn't it? Right. So uh, based on you know, the studies that we reviewed, we did, and you know my little experience, uh, I can probably just make it simple just for understanding that we have to either replace the head or repair MCL. Uh, it's not always we do both together. So depending on the availability and how quick you want to uh, conclude the surgery, we don't really need to address MCL. And I have done that very, very few instances. So when you replace the head, you don't really need to address MCL. If you don't have radial head replacement or you cannot, you don't do internal fixation. I mean, something to preserve the lateral column, the radial capitular joint, you have to maintain that joint. If you cannot maintain and restore that joint, you have to repair medial site. Thank you, Amir, for that. And the other question is regarding those cadaveric studies that you did, the pull test and the lateral pull test. What are the implications? Is it when you are planning for a replacement versus an excision? Right. So if you're planning for excision, so probably you're planning to repair medial and lateral site, which commonly is done in you know places that metal implants are, there's a shortage, they're not really readily available or they're expensive. So there are many cases I can see that in Iran and many other places, excision of the head is a uh, standard of care for radial head fractures. However, we know that repairing MCL, we cannot predict if we have intraosseous ligament injury or not. And we have seen those cases. Uh, therefore, we have to use those two tests intraoperatively to uh, make sure if we have intraosseous ligament injury or not. The problem with these two tests is that they can only distinguish intraosseous ligament injury only if it's a complete rupture. If it's attenuated ligaments, if it's incomplete rupture, probably we cannot perform the test uh, properly. And the displacement is not to the extent that we realize it's unstable. So if we excise the head, we just leave the patient alone. Along the time, the attenuated ligament will be torn completely and the radius displaces, migrates proximally, and we then have problems. Uh, so we cannot really rely on these tests. We can do perform these tests intraoperatively just to make sure if it's complete or not, not complete. But we cannot really comment on injured or non-injured. Thank you for that, Amir. And congratulations for the new innovative idea of using the bone cement. Have you published the study yourselves? Or there are a lot of publications on usage of uh, cement as a spacer. It's kind of a spacer, isn't it? 
Right. So actually, we came up with this idea because uh, at the time I was in Iran and started doing elbow surgery. Uh, metal implants were not readily available to us and insurance is not covering. So it was a little expensive just to provide for, to the patients. So we came up with the idea of using bone cement because we need something to fill out that space and to maintain the area, maintain. Uh, we cannot really always rely on MCL repair. Uh, I was reading one paper reported, uh, I don't know which country it came from, but very good results with using bone cement as a spacer for radial head. So they made, they used uh, bone cement intraoperatively. They just used single screw as stem and had bone cement just around it manually. They shaped it in the OR and just put it in place. It was not anatomic radial head. So even if it was not measured or, and they may have overstuffed the area, they really published good results and their rate of removal was not much actually and the results was good. So I took that idea of using bone cement from that study and kind of combined that with a 3D printing idea just to design the head based on the anatomy of the contralateral site, just to make a mold and have the anatomy of the patient, which was really successful. And so the uh, criticism to this idea is that how do we know bone cement is rubbing against capitellum, which is a cartilage? So first of all, we use cement, but it's only for fitness of a, another implant. It's not the moving part. It's just a stable part. Here, we're using it as a moving uh, part in, in, in the body, and it's moving against cartilage. And it's not as smooth as metal implants. And we were really concerned. I could not really answer that question. Uh, however, I did not show that here. We had a patient that because of um, heterotopic ossification, 16 months after surgery, I had to go back and remove that you know, bone piece. So I had a second look at the cartilage and it was completely normal. And uh, the, no one of our patients, we have a more than two year follow-up. Uh, we started doing that since 2016 and 17. Uh, and kind of increase the number. Uh, we didn't have any case of radiocapitular arthritis or any issues with the cartilage uh, damage or, or wearing of the cartilage or the capitella. Uh, so, so far, I can probably say midterm results show that we can probably use bone cement. Even if you use it manually, make something as a spacer in the OR, it will work. If you can use a 3D printing technology and designing technology, definitely you can make it even more sophisticated and better for the patient. Thank you, Amir, for that. And uh, suppose there's a radial neck fracture that is complete. Do you think the remaining part of the radial head will, uh, in case it doesn't unite, do you think that the remaining part will also act like a spacer so that you can treat them very conservatively, isn't it? I like your idea exactly. And I can say, I can say I had a case, I had a patient, I didn't have this slide here, but I have that one that uh, when I went in, I opened, the head was complete, it was intact, just broke from the neck. And uh, since I didn't have anything ready to fix it, I didn't want to use K wire to fix it and then go back again to take the wires out. And I felt the elbow is stable. I just left it back in place. And the patient was doing well. Uh, I have the follow-ups and range, complete range of motion, no pain. Exactly as you mentioned, it can work as a spacer. If, we can, if it's not broken, if it's only neck, because we need a complete head to work as a spacer there. And that's true. Yeah. Mayor. yeah. Thank you, Amir. I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for the fantastic session, fantastic lecture. And I'm really happy for the number of publications that you've churned out in the last uh, 10 years, if I'm right. And congratulations uh, on the great feat. Uh, sure. 
And uh, I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Amir, thank you so much for joining in. Hopefully, so uh, I would like to you know thank my you know co-authors and my mentors. These are not my ideas, not all of them, and not all of them are my patients. So these are all during my education and learning something. And I'm still in the process of learning and experiencing more and more. And so I'd like to just thank my you know mentors, supervisors, and uh, inspirations of elbow surgery to me. Hopefully, we can just promote this, these techniques and uh, the whole elbow concepts to get more motion back to elbow. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank you so much for arranging all this session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.